Christ. And there you are. You're running for your life. You're a shooting star. And all the years, no one knows just how hard you worked. But now it shows. Time is short, and the world is long. In the blinking of an eye, that moment's gone. And when it's done, win or lose, you always need your best. Cause inside you knew. One of the all-time shockers, Lehigh defeats Duke in the air. No, Syracuse. Feel the wind in your face. It's more than a contest. It's more than a contest. Taylor chased by White. Taylor scores. Cause inside you know In one shining moment You reach for the sky In one shining moment You move In one shining moment You're going to try In one College basketball's moment, greatest night has arrived And the Kentucky coronation is complete. Champions 2012. Sports fans, diehards, and of course, bandwagon jumpers. Welcome to the new segment of The Sports Doctrine. I'm Cameron Tindall and this is Armand Brody. And we're going to start you guys off with the top story, of course, the 2012 National Champion Kentucky Wildcats. Doc, what's your reaction to that game and Kentucky winning the championship? You know what? You asked me for my reaction, but I'm going to ask you for your reaction. Because you have something on your mind and you just might as well just need to get it out there and just let it be known. What have you got to say? Just tell everybody what you have to say. Nation, for a minute, I'm going to be a fan <laughs> and not a journalist. Now, I told you Kentucky was going to win the championship. He's a North Carolina fan, folks, as you guys all know. And I'm going to rub it in his face that Kentucky won the championship. I've been preaching for the past few years about Kentucky winning the championship. And they finally got over the hump, and I just need to get that out. Woohoo, Kentucky, let's go. Now, let's start this coming from an objective analyst. Later. I told you guys that I was a fan for a minute and a minute only. Now let's get back to this journalistic integrity thing. But I want to take a, I want to make a point about Kentucky. There was no question about it. They were the best team. Kansas had no shot. Everybody knew that going. I think Greg Anthony picked Kansas during the broadcast of CBS, and I'm thinking to myself, Greg, you were me, and you were here. But when you pick Kansas. You completely lost all credibility with me because this Kansas team was by far a lesser talented team than Kentucky. When you talk about Anthony Davis, you talk about Michael Kidd Gilchrist, you talk about Deron Lamb, you talk about all the cast of thousands that make up this great Kentucky team, there was no way in the world that Kansas was going to be able to pull off that championship against Kentucky on Monday night. But it seemed like the real championship game was on Saturday with Louisville because you have the big in-state rivalry, you have the big patino Calipari thing going on, and that game seemed to be so much more dramatic because Louisville, home with Kentucky for a lot of that game, Patino tried to slow that game down, and of course Kentucky came out on top, but there seemed to be so much more drama 
even from the fan standpoint in the Louisville game. And by the time they got to Kansas, it was it was a wrap. I agree with you there. I personally thought was a, I was afraid I might say that Kentucky would take that game against Louisville at the championship. Especially considering John Calipari's past with his teams and them not being focused and them almost getting there. You know all the stories. It seems like almost every year John Calipari almost getting there. And I was afraid after all that hoopla after beating Louisville that Kentucky would come into the national championship game feeling like they've already won. You know, feeling themselves. But at the same time, I said earlier this season that Kentucky losing to Vanderbilt in that SEC championship game was the reason that Kentucky was going to win the championship. They say that. That prepared them for this. They needed to lose that game to know that somebody could beat them and that if they lose focus, that they can lose. That's something that other Kentucky teams didn't have. John, John Wall and all those guys, those guys were cocky, doing dances and everything after they scored, just thinking, oh, yeah, no one can beat us. You know what I'm saying? They lost. The team with Brandon Knight and uh, Terrence Jones and those guys last year who reached the Final Four, they weren't even expected to get as far as they did, and they went far and got all the way to the Final Four and choked. This team, this speaks a lot to John Calipari. This speaks a lot to this team's, this team's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, legendary status. This team's, no, this team's clout and they're just will to win. Like, they're, this, these are, they got three freshmen and two sophomores starting on this team. There's no business looking at, looking at their classes on paper that they should have been in the national championship. This team only lost two games. They won the most games in college basketball history. This is a team with guys that just played in high school last year just won the national championship. Can you, can you just fathom saying that? Could you even have ever imagined that? Aside from the teams, the bad boy teams of Michigan and with Chris Weber and Jalen Rose and those guys, this is probably the best showing of freshmen and sophomores ever in college basketball history. But see, I want to make a point to you now that, all right, Kentucky had all these young players, but we have to admit, college basketball is nowhere as good overall from top to bottom team-wise as it was in the days of Chris Webber. Agreed. Even 10, 12 years ago, even five or six years ago, the teams that were in college basketball were better than the teams that are in college basketball now. So when you look at it from that standpoint, if Kentucky didn't win this championship, it would have been an absolute shame because there is no other team on in the college game besides maybe a healthy North Carolina. There was no other team that could compete with Kentucky because college basketball as a whole is down. So they had to win this thing. If, if Calipari didn't win this one, it would have been on. Oh, oh, been yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They probably would have been ready to run them out of Kentucky. You know, uh, I agree with you that college basketball is definitely not in its best state. You know, for the first time in years, we actually have the overwhelming number one team win. There's no question that Kentucky was the best team in college basketball this year. In years past, you have a lot of questions about who was really the best team, or this team was this team let us down. Should have won and didn't. We got Butler playing in two straight national championship games. I mean, <laughs> what what kind of state? No, not you guys at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just a great nothing, nothing, nothing against Butler now, but we all know you, you want to see Kentucky and Kansas, you do. North Carolina, Duke. You want to see those guys in championship. It's, it's good for the sport. It's good for the game of college basketball. It just is. Since Dan Patrick makes a good statement on his show. He says, when it comes to the first couple rounds of the tournament, we like to see an upset here or there, 13 beat a 4, a 12 beat a 5, whatever, whatever. But when you get down to the Elite Eight and the Final Four, you want to see the Indianas and the Kentuckys and the Dukes and the North Carolinas. Not just from a rating standpoint, but because those are the teams who usually have the best talent. Mm -hmm. And it was imperative and important for Kentucky to win this championship this year because it seems to help college basketball kind of take its rightful place again because you had these few years of just dreadful mm -hmm. play. Yes. That Butler uh, Connecticut game was horrible. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. Not to mention the, the Butler and Duke game wasn't much better. Horrible. Was there was, there better. was terrible offense. I mean, it just was not entertaining mm -hmm. basketball. Agreed. Agreed. So to see Kentucky win this thing is a plus, not just for college basketball, but for Kentucky, even though they're going to have to do it all over again because half the roster is going to be going to the NBA. As <laughs> we're just going to that's up in there. We're just going to have to see about that. Uh, Anthony on. Davis and Michael Kidd, Kidd Gilchrist are definitely out. Like, they're the number one, number one and two picks. They'll almost be stupid if they were the state. But, you know, I think that Kentucky can compete next year if Marcus Teague, Deron Lamb, and Terrence Jones all come back and combine with Tony Parker. But you know that's not going to happen. I don't know now. Terrence Jones surprised some people by coming back this year. Maybe he'll come back for another year. I believe Teague will definitely come back. I don't think he's ready to make that move to the next level, but you never know with Kentucky. I mean, John Calipari, I mean, it probably doesn't really matter much to him. He's been doing it 
for, for the past few years. I mean, he's either going to start over with a new bunch, and it's going to be the same discussion next year. Is Kentucky too young? Do, are they, do they have enough experience? Do they have enough chemistry? Can they develop in time? It's going to be the same question next year. And who knows? Maybe we'll be discussing a repeat next year. But what made college basketball so great then, and I'm going to end this portion of our conversation with this, what made college basketball so great years ago was that you had veterans, you had seniors and juniors. You remember Mateen Cleese? Oh yeah. In 2000? Uh -huh. Did you watch, you remember the video when he was watching One Shining Moment and tears were just rolling down his eyes because he had just realized how much he had accomplished and how far he had come mm -hmm. as a young man, as a player at Michigan State, all the years that he spent there? I miss that in college mm -hmm. basketball. I miss the camaraderie that players feel because they've been together two mm -hmm. and three and four years and they they, they, they struggle together mm -hmm. in that first year or that second year. And then that third or fourth year they start to mm -hmm. come on with it. Mm -hmm. And then right before their career ends, they're holding up that national championship banner. That's something that I miss in college basketball. And that's why there's always a piece of me that kind of misses the good days of college basketball, the better days, I should say. College basketball is still good. But nonetheless, congratulations to Kentucky on a great championship. I, I agree with you there, Doc, and I know you don't want to elaborate too much on it, but I'm going to boost the ego here. That North Carolina team, Tyler Harrisburg, Ty Thank Lawson, you. and all those guys, Thank you. It, it just doesn't get much better than that. And to see guys work from freshmen and come all the way up to their senior years and finally get the job done. We all knew North Carolina was going to win the championship. Mm -hmm. If they had to, it was inevitable. That team had been together so long, and they were the best for so long. To see them accomplish everything over those four years was just great. And I agree with you there on the state of college basketball. Let's hope it uh, picks up some. All right, folks, we talked about Kentucky as a team. Now we're going to focus on John Calipari. He finally gets the big one. So my question is to you, Cam, where does John Calipari rank among the great coaches in college basketball now? Or coaches, period, if you want to go that far. This is a tough question. I think that John Calipari, he, he, he was already a top ten coach before winning the championship. Actively. Coaches actively coaching. I think this boosts him into the top five. You know, I I would still put Calhoun of Connecticut, Patino, Roy Williams, Tom Izzo, and maybe Coach K ahead of him. And then Calipari. I think Calipari has one more championship. He has to prove himself one more time to go up in that upper echelon to be known as one of the, without a doubt, greatest of all time. As far as recruiting, he might be the best recruiter of all time, period. Yeah. I know he's the best recruiter actively right now in college basketball, but as far as All right, folks, welcome back to the Sports Doctrine. This is Cameron Tindall. My name is Armand Brody. And in our last segment, we talked about John Calipari and his place among great college basketball coaches of today. But my question to you, Doc, is, is he Hall of Famer? That's a tough question. Uh, speaking totally objectively here, you know, I believe that John Calipari is not a Hall of Famer just yet. I don't want to be one of those guys who live in the moment and say, Oh, this guy's a Hall of Famer because he finally won the championship or because he's done something great now that he automatically goes to the Hall of Fame, much like the Tom Coughlin situation oh. in NY. I don't, I don't want to be one of those people, so I'm going to say no, but with him winning this championship at Kentucky, that factors in a lot. You know, the big programs like Kentucky, Kansas, Duke, North Carolina, winning the championship with those programs automatically almost launches you into the Hall of Fame discussion at the very least. I will say this, he probably could get into the Hall of Fame with his credentials now given what he did with Memphis and UMass and, and now Kentucky finally winning it. But I think that he has to win one more title. I think he has to prove himself one more time, you know, simply because all of the criticism that he's taken with all the sanctions of the teams and he doesn't keep players long and all of this. I feel like he has to prove that one more time. If he wins the championship again, there's absolutely nothing that anyone can say to this guy. But see, I have an opposing point of view, of course. Uh, couldn't one say that he should not ever be in the Hall of Fame because of all the bridges that he's burned and because of all the illegal activity that he's been involved with before? Wow, that... That, that's a pretty tough question. Uh, I never really looked at it that way. I'm pretty sure Bob Knight would agree with you <laughs> there because he, he, we all know how he feels about John Calipari. So but I don't think the 
sanction should really affect him because because when you think about it, the sanctions weren't against him. It was a, it was against the program, but they weren't against him. But it was under his watch and it was under his leadership. True, true, true. But at the same time, they weren't directly linked to him. And obviously, if they were directly linked to him, then maybe he wouldn't even be coaching right now. But I guess it remains to see what happens with Kentucky, whether they're going to get their championship vacated or anything. I think if something happens with Kentucky, it's out of the question. He he may not coach in college again, and he he may not. He definitely won't make the Hall of Fame if something that, if something goes down with this Kentucky situation. But which I don't think it will. I don't want to speak that on John Calipari at all. But I, I feel like he's not ready for the Hall of Fame right now. I feel like he has to prove himself one more time to consider himself a lot in the Hall of Fame. I just hope that nothing comes out. You know, Me years too. down the line, because to have all of those great wins and that great accomplishment taken away from you because of activities that went on under your watch. I mean, the Derrick Rose situation, yeah. the Marcus Camby situation, all the way at UMass back in the mid '90s. Yeah. For those sorts of things to happen, it just really does leave a scar on you, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why you have people like Bob Knight. Now, granted, he shouldn't be doing it the way he's doing it. Because he's an analyst and he's supposed to be a professional and he's supposed to have some common sense. Mm -hmm. But for him to burn a lot of the bridges the way he did, mm -hmm. it does put a scar on his record. And it does put a stain on his uh, mm -hmm. credibility and a stain on his legend as a great college basketball coach. And I do think, you know how people are. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rich Miller didn't even make the Hall of Fame his first time. Explain that to me. Mm -hmm. So... And Chris Mullen made it. Yeah, Chris Mullen made it, but Reggie Miller did not make it. Reggie Miller, who's the best shooter, the best shooter in the history of the NBA, didn't make the Hall of Fame the first time. So I hope that this Kentucky tenure doesn't come back to hurt him. I really, I really don't. I, I don't think it will. I, I really think that you know that he's done, that he's done everything the right way at Kentucky. I mean, he, if he hasn't learned from the previous situation, then maybe he doesn't deserve to coach. You know, at another college, but. I really think that Calipari has done it the right way this time. He won. He's won the championship. So let's celebrate him winning the championship instead of downplaying it by talking about his past. Let's hope that it doesn't get taken away years down the line. Okay? Yeah. Because what he's done at Kentucky is very noteworthy, and you hope. You just hope, 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 hope. As long as Kentucky struggled with the Billy Gillespie, how terrible was that tenure, and, and oh, the way Tubby Smith went out, all that kind of stuff. Let's hope that Kentucky's on the right path now, and Calipari's going to be there mm -hmm. for years to come, being competitive in college basketball. Well, we're going to talk now about the NBA, and there's a big doubleheader going on tonight with the Thunder and the Heat, and the Lakers and the Clippers, they're doing battle tonight on ESPN. So, Doc, how, how significant are these two games as we get closer to the playoffs? Uh, well, first I'm going to start with the Oklahoma City Thunder versus the Miami Heat. On a scale of 1 to 10, I give this game a 2 in significance. <laughs> because simply it does not matter until the playoffs start, especially for the Miami Heat. These guys cannot prove anything to me in the regular season. I don't care whether they finish with a 1 seed, a 2 seed, a 7 seed. Until the NBA Finals get here or the Eastern Conference Finals, I don't want to hear anything from the Heat. I'm not taking this loss that they recently had to the Boston Celtics seriously, that loss to Oklahoma City in Oklahoma City, I'm not taking that seriously. But what I will say is that Oklahoma City Thunder have a lot of fire. They have a lot to prove against the Miami Heat. So how do the Thunder have something to prove but the Heat don't? Explain that to me. Because the Thunder, they feel like they're being overlooked. Everyone's talking about the Heat winning. You know, the Heat are getting all of, t of the attention. The Bulls probably feel overlooked too because they've been and they the best team, even without their role. They they've been the best team in the Eastern Conference. And I feel like Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, of course, you know, are feeling like, you know, we're being overlooked. Why aren't we, you know, why, why isn't anyone or much of anyone talking about us when, why is, why is it LeBron and Dwayne Wade all the time? And I feel like the Thunder are going to come out there like, you know, we can beat these guys. That's, that's what they did in Oklahoma City. Like, we can beat these guys. We have, we have a big two as well as the Heat. So we can compete just like these guys. We just, we're, we're liable to score 50 points, you know, a piece and any night too, and any given time as well. So. I feel like the Thunder are going to come out with the fire. They may actually beat the Heat tonight, you know, depending on whether Dwayne Wade is going to play tonight. The Heat may actually get up for this game. And that's going to take me into another thing that I wanted to say. I feel like the Heat are the best team in the NBA. Do not get me wrong about this. The Heat, when they want to play, are the best team far and beyond in the NBA. 
far and beyond, far and beyond, far and beyond, far and beyond. When the Heat, when the Heat are playing motivated and they want to win, far and beyond the best. So if the Heat are, as you say, far and beyond, if, when they want to play, if they played the Thunder in the NBA Finals, how many games would they beat the Thunder in? I'm not even sure that they would beat the Thunder in a seven game series. But you just said they were they were the best team when they played. When motivated and when playing to their full potential. LeBron has shown that he's not going to play in his goal. <laughs> <laughs> and the biggest thing, so who knows what LeBron's going to show up? What LeBron's going to show up in the NBA Finals? Is it going to be LeBron that's spectacular in the regular season? Or is it going to be La Choke? You know, I, I don't know. So, you <laughs> really cannot. <laughs> you, really, you really can't predict that. I seen something the other day that <laughs> says, the LaFone. <laughs> Only vibrates, no ring. <laughs> but I do have some interest in this game tonight. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there are certain games that you need, to, you need to step up for. I mean, I know that the NBA season is long and the Heat are already determining that they're going to be the number one or number two seed in the Eastern Conference and the playoffs are close and yeah, we're focused on a championship. But I just think from a mentality standpoint, you need to get up for this game, you know? Mm -hmm. This is a game. All right, think about it. The Thunder destroyed the Heat. No, they did. The Thunder destroyed they did. the Bulls. And they beat the Lakers handily as well. Mm -hmm. So, from a Heat standpoint, I want to see the Heat get up mm -hmm. for a big game in the regular season. Mm -hmm. Every time I expect the Heat to do something in the regular season, you know, they have these just slack, letdown games where they don't show up the way they need to. And it makes me wonder, if they do it like that in the regular season, how much more difficult is it to play with the right mentality in the playoffs for them, considering the fact that you have a LeBron James who will disappear, that you have a Chris Bosh who is not always dependable, and that you have an Eric Spolstra who people still don't believe is the best coach for that team. Of course, the role players, too. Yeah, yeah. And it makes me wonder, do they, do they have enough mentally? to win a championship. And I still don't know. I, I still don't know if the Heat have I, enough to win a championship. I, I, I really agree with you there. Like, the Heat, you never know what team is going to show up. Well, you have to look at it from the Heat point of view. If the Heat win this game tonight against the Thunder, then it's going to be, you know, okay, well, you did that in the regular season, but who cares? Are you going to win the final? But if they lose, then it's going to be a big all. Oh, the Heat are not playing well. So that's it's true. really a lose-lose for the Miami Heat. So that's why I say it's irrelevant until, until the playoff again. It is. I'm just saying... I want this Heat team to put up or shut up. Agreed. It's like, I personally think, I think the Bulls are a great team. I think the Bulls have a tremendous defense. Yes, the Heat, the Heat defense is very good as well. But I think the Bulls defense, there's just something about them that makes me say, look at what those guys do on both sides of the ball. And without, even without Dick Rose being in there, I think that Bulls team is great. But... It's almost like I'm picking the Heat to win the East by default. Yeah. And that frustrates me because I want to see some team have enough to kind of stay with them, to kind of be with them mm -hmm. when the Eastern Conference playoffs come around. And unlike our, our friend Thomas, the oh, 76ers Thomas. will not be, <laughs> we will oh, not be the Heat. <laughs> Thomas, if you're watching this, no, the Sixers have no chance no. of beating the Miami Heat or the Chicago Bulls, maybe not even the New York Knicks. How did the Knicks get in that conversation? But anyway, the Bulls are a team that I would love to see take the Heat to six or seven games, unlike the five games that they took them to last year. But I just don't think they have enough offensively to go with the Heat toe-to-toe. -to -toe. But at the same time, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of if the Heat make it to the finals, I think the Thunder have their number. I really do. I think the Thunder have enough to win a championship right now to beat the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals if those two match. So you're making an early pick for the NBA Finals? Are you picking the Thunder to win the NBA Championship this year? I guess I am. I guess you can well, tell me that. Yeah. Yeah. You got it on film, folks. Armand Brody picks the Oklahoma City Thunder to beat the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals. And you don't. I'm going to save my pick to close to the playoff time. Oops. So I get to put my pick out there now, but... You're so good that yeah, we have to wait on your pick later yeah, on. Yeah, it's a game of poker, you know. I got a <laughs> poker face on this time, you know. Save myself for later. Okay, I see how you want to play. <laughs> Next game is the Lakers and the Clippers. Uh, this game intrigues me, not as much as the Thunder Heat game does. But Lakers and Clippers, we all know about the stuff that's been going on with the Lakers, the whole Andrew buying them stuff and Kobe being benched and a little riffraff with Derek Fisher being gone and all that kind of stuff. What does this game mean? Does it mean anything at all? 
this game on the scale of <laughs> one to ten, negative, anything, negative anything. This game means nothing. The Clippers have already shown that they're not going to compete for the title. They're, they're, not, they're not going anywhere in the West. The Lakers. They have no camaraderie. Where, where, where's the chemistry and camaraderie? You got Andrew Bynum taking three pointers, being benched for it, and then coming out and saying, "Well, I'm going to take more three pointers." You cannot, you cannot pick a team like that to win the West or to win anything. I wouldn't be surprised if the Lakers get bounced out of the first round. To be honest, I feel like any of those top eight teams in the West could beat the Lakers in a seven game series. I feel like this team is slowly falling apart. I said at the beginning of the season that it would be nothing short of a Hollywood show in LA, and it's been even worse than that. Andrew Bynum, he makes his first All-Star game. Now he feels like he's Michael Jordan. He can do anything he wants. You know, I, I, I just this game is really not important to me. It has no importance as far as the playoffs are concerned. Maybe when it comes to seeding and all of that, but other than the seeding, this game is of no relevance. I can only hope and pray that the Spurs just really take off this postseason. It's the only chance. It's the only chance that the West has of putting a team in the NBA Finals. Other than, Oklahoma, other than the Oklahoma City Thunder, it's the San Antonio Spurs. I can only hope that the Spurs somehow or another that those those legs get a little bit younger. The Ben Gay gets rubbed on a little bit harder. <laughs> I don't know what they have to do, but I would love to see the Spurs make it there just to give some kind of uh, competitive balance to the West and not have the Thunder just take it and run away with it because it seems like the Thunder are probably going to be the team that's going to represent the the, the Western Conference in the NBA Finals. I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you there. Yeah, but those are two games on tonight that if you want to watch, watch, but apparently Cam is not because on a scale of 1 to 10, they are a negative. Whatever I'll see you guys in May. In May. That's when I'll be watching. We'll be back in May. Well, we had an interesting comment made uh, by an NFL quarterback. Baltimore Ravens QB Joe Flacco said that he is the best quarterback in the NFL. Cam, tell me why he is crazy. <laughs> This is absolute nonsense coming from Joe Flacco. What merits him? What is going through his mind that he can say he's the best quarterback in the NFL? What happens to self confidence? What's wrong with self confidence? There's between self confidence and stupidity. He's not the best quarterback in the NFL. What has he done? What has Joe Flacco done? Statistically, it, oh my God, statistically, he, he's probably in maybe in the upper half of quarterbacks in this league. If I can, I can probably name ten quarterbacks off the head that are better than Joe Flacco. Joe, I'm not saying that Joe Flacco is not a good quarterback. He is a good quarterback, but the best quarterback, absolutely not. Those comments are ridiculous and don't even deserve more than a few minutes of conversation on the show. But there are a few quarterbacks that he's better than. Joe Flacco has made a few plays. Yeah, John Beck and Rex Grossman. <laughs> he's definitely better than those guys. <laughs> All right, Flacco or Romo? Hmm. Romo. I'll take Romo. You taking Romo? I'll take Romo. Turnover prone Tony Romo. When you need him the most, he shows up the least, Tony Romo. 06 playoffs, and I'm still bringing it up. Okay. 06 playoffs, fumble snap, Tony Romo. But what, really, Romo is probably a worse, <laughs> probably worse in late game situations. And situations where he has to step up, Flacco is not much better. Uh, you, you could probably go either way with Flacco and Romo because Flacco has done the same thing. Flacco hasn't stepped up when Baltimore is needed. Baltimore is still yet to get to the Super Bowl with him at the helm. And Baltimore has had the best team for the past few years now. I really think so. That's really been a big disappointment because mm -hmm. I thought they were a better team than the Patriots were. Yeah, definitely. And, and they let the Patriots uh, run away with that AFC title game and represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. I agree. And I think Baltimore was better than them. I agree. Flacco said he was the best. Hey, it worked for Eli Manning, right? Eli Manning said he was among the elite quarterbacks, and what happened? Eli he won a Super Bowl, right? Yeah, he had one previous before he said that. He won <laughs> a Super Bowl 4,000 yards. Hey, it could happen this year. Maybe Baltimore can get there. Reed's coming back, right? Maybe they can get there this year. I don't care if Baltimore goes to the Super Bowl and wins it. Flacco is not the best quarterback in the NFL, and it will never be. Now, I never, I never said that he was the best quarterback. I'm just trying to give him a Yeah, yeah, I understand, but I, I'm, just, I'm just making it known. Flacco does not deserve any more than this conversation that we're giving him on the show. I will never talk about this ever again because it's not a subject. Flacco, you are not the best quarterback in the NFL, point blank. So who is the best quarterback in the NFL? Without a question, Tom Brady. Without a question? Without a question. Tom Brady over Drew Brees? Yes. Over Peyton Manning? Yes. Clearly, just 
that simple. I mean, Drew Brees had a, a fantastic record-breaking season. Drew Brees had this past this past year. He did have a record-breaking season this past year, but let's not forget about Tom Brady's phenomenal season when he had Randy Moss and those guys who should have went undefeated and won the Super Bowl. Probably the best team to ever step on a field. So, and let's not forget that Tom Brady's the three Super Bowls that he has. So. I, I really can't go against Tom Brady at all. So if you wanted a quarterback right now, you start with Tom Brady. Yes, I, right start, now. I start with Tom Brady. If I need a player, period, I'm going Tom Brady. Oh. He makes he makes he makes everyone better around him. Just look at what he's had. Like aside from Randy Moss, he really hasn't had any names to throw the ball to or to hand the ball all to at that. Corey Dillon, <laughs> uh, Brian oh, Woodhead. Oh, come on, man. Like, Tom Brady. Danny Woodhead. Yeah, Danny Woodhead. See, I don't even know his name. That's not relevant. <laughs> See, <laughs> Peyton Manning, he has a case, of course, four-time MVP. You know, he has a Super Bowl. Only one. Though. Yeah, only one Super Bowl. That's, that's big. But Peyton Manning has also had the necessary weapons around him. Granted, Tom Brady has had better defense. Granted. Mm -hmm. But Peyton Manning has always had Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison, mm -hmm. Dallas Clark, those guys. Even Ezra James, you know, rushing for a thousand yards consistently for a few years there in Indianapolis. So, uh... I'm going to have to go with Tom Brady as far as body of work and the amount of talent that he has or has had and the amount of Super Bowls that he's won. Given his situations, I'm going to have to go with Tom Brady. So, question. Does Brady win another Super Bowl before his career is over? I'm going to have to say no. I felt like this was his last chance to win another Super Bowl. and I was hoping that he would win. And I, I felt that if he won that Super Bowl, that he's the greatest quarterback of all time, period. That's how I feel, and I still feel that way. If he wins one more Super Bowl, he should go down as the greatest ever. But I don't think he will. I feel, I feel that New England has reached their peak, and that they're, they're not going to win any more Super Bowls. Yeah. Tom Brady, you know, he's he's almost beyond his prime, and I just don't feel that New England is is going to make it to another Super Bowl. You know, not 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 win it. And I don't even think they're going to make it to another Super Bowl. So hopefully Baltimore can finally get something together and. Well, as far as Tom Brady winning on Super Bowl, I, I just simply don't see it happening. I see it, even if he gets there, I see an NFC team taking taking it. Uh, I, the Patriots just the Patriots weren't the best team this year. They shouldn't have been to the Super Bowl this year. I will admit that the Patriots should not have been to the Super Bowl this year. Despite me picking them to go to the Super Bowl, I don't feel that they should have made it this year. I don't feel that like they were the best team, and I don't feel like they're going to be the best team next year or for years to come. And if they make it, it's going to be simple because, you know, hot screen. You know how these teams make it these days on hot screens at the end. Mm -hmm. But my prediction, Tom Brady's not going to get into more Super Bowls, but he's still the best quarterback in the NFL. Right and why now. haven't we mentioned Aaron Rodgers? You wouldn't take Aaron Rodgers over Tom Brady right now. I wouldn't. You would I wouldn't. Wow. Okay. Okay. I, Aaron Rodgers, he's a great quarterback. I'm not taking anything away from him. He's an awesome quarterback. Tom Brady's an awesome quarterback as well, though. Okay, with three Super Bowls. Who, who's, who's the who's the reigning MVP? Aaron Rodgers. Who just won the more recent Super Bowl? Aaron Rodgers. But Aaron Rodgers is not the quarterback that you want right now. Aaron Rodgers' team got bounced out of the second round of the, of the playoffs this year. You know, he had a phenomenal season, but his team got bounced out of the second round. By the Super Bowl champions! Yeah, and the, and the Patriots went to the Super Bowl. Tom Brady has taken the Patriots to five Super Bowls. <laughs> You can't ask for more than that out of a quarterback. Aaron Rodgers just simply hasn't put in the necessary work yet. You got to give it a few more years. I don't feel like you can put Aaron Rodgers on the pedestal ahead of Tom Brady just yet. I still take Drew Brees over Aaron Rodgers. Mm -mm. I would. Wow. Wow. I would. Aaron, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> on behalf of the sports doctrine, I sincerely apologize because you are getting no respect on this show. None whatsoever. I'll take Aaron Rodgers third. I'll take Tom Brady. Drew Brees and then Aaron Rodgers. And MVP is third on the list. But well, yes, three, Drew Brees and Brady have one I know, yeah. but Aaron Rodgers is a great quarterback. Yeah, I mean, but you can you can really go either way. You know what I'm saying? You can get you can you can pick Aaron Rodgers. I wouldn't be mad if you was, you say you would say that you would take Aaron Rodgers over Tom Brady over Drew Brees. You can really go either way. I, I would just take Tom Brady first and then Drew Brees second. For the record, I, I like Brady. I'm just stirring up stuff because I like to do that. <laughs> That's what I do. Folks, we want to thank you for watching this fun edition of The Sports Doctrine. This is Cameron Tindall. My name is Aaron Brody. We'll see. Appreciate you watching.